What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Everything But Politics podcast. Today's guest is Dr. Judd Brewer. Dr. Judd is a psychiatrist, neuroscientist, and the chief medical officer at ShareCare. He's also an associate professor of behavioral and social sciences in the School of Public Health and the Director of Research and Innovation at the Mindfulness Center at Brown University. Dr. Judd, thank you for being a guest of the Everything But Politics podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's very exciting. Um, I guess uh, me and Evan both have so many questions for you just about uh, certain th parts of the brain and understanding anxiety and stress at a deeper level. But before we get into that, uh, we were curious, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself prior to you becoming um, an MD, achieving your PhD? What was your fascination to uh, getting into the medical field? You know, I was a chemistry major in college and I loved the the molecules of life. And just to sound way too much like a geek, uh, I remember my freshman chemistry class, they talked about these these molecules called like cadaverine and putrescine. And and you can imagine what those smell like, right? So, <laughs> and I just thought it was the coolest thing that a, a fatty acid molecule could, ma could make somebody, you know, smell a certain smell that made them, you know, made them think of, I mean, this is a little morbid, but like, that's what happens when, when flesh is rotting. <laughs> so, so I just thought it was amazing that molecules could translate into life and wanted to learn all about that became a, you know, thought I was going to be a chemist and then realized that, you know, molecules make up life, but they aren't life. And so wanted to do something uh, more directly applicable in terms of research, love doing research, found, realized that in college, I just love doing research. And so found out that I could do these MD, this MD PhD program where I could actually do medically related research and, um, you know, got on board it was just really, really stoked to be able to, uh, both learn about all the, the amazing, you know, the, this amazing physiology that we have as, as a human body and, and also learn about the, the brain mind body connection. I remember my, my brother's uh, wife was she, uh, when they got married, like she got sick on their honeymoon. And I was like, oh, you know, that can't be a, you know, it was like all, you know, she couldn't get sick until they were married. And then like her body was like, okay, now you can get sick. And I was like, this is so interesting, you know, how our minds and our bodies work together. And we really have very little idea of how that works so i wanted to be part of that discovery process yeah i mean it's certainly interesting the relationship between the body and mind and that's one of the reasons that we were so uh, excited for this interview with you and be able to sit down with you so with with all of this going on in your head at a young age what led to you what led you to shift your focus more towards stress anxiety well, I was pretty stressed out at the end of college. In fact, I didn't even know that I was stressed out. It was showing up in my body at another mind-body connection. I'll, I'll spare you the gory details, <laughs> but let's just say my GI system let me know that I uh, that I was pretty stressed out. And I later found out that I had irritable bowel syndrome. And so it's, you know, it's like, for me, that, you know, showed up as, as bowel symptoms, um, but it was, you know, it was due to stress. And you know, I, I started meditating my first day of medical school as a way to kind of learn how to um, learn how my mind worked and also to learn some tools to work with stress. And even, you know, so fast forward about eight years when I was in residency, I started getting panic attacks <laughs> during, during residency. And, you know, because I was studying psychiatry, I I could, you know, wake up from in the middle of the night with a full blown panic attack. And then um, I would actually use some of my mindfulness practices that I'd learned you know, over the last eight years to, to work with the panic attack. And then when it passed, I'd go through this checklist, you know, it's like, check, 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 you know, because all these things I'd learned in, in medical school and residency is like, oh yeah, I just had a panic attack. And then I could actually roll over and, and go back to sleep because I didn't have to, I didn't have to worry about it. It's interesting because panic disorder isn't just about having panic attacks. It's more about worrying when somebody's going to have the next panic attack and avoiding things in life because of it. And so there 
I could start to, you know, I got really interested in, in learning how anxiety showed up, um, you know, learning from my own panic attacks, et cetera. And also when I finished residency, I was really struggling as a physician to help my patients with anxiety, you know, the best class of medications out there, there's this term number needed to treat, which just is basically how many people you need to treat with a treatment before one person benefits. So the higher the number, the worse off it is. With medications, it's 5.2. So basically I was playing the medication lottery where you know one in five patients was going to show a significant reduction in symptoms. And then also, you know, so I didn't know which one of the five it was, and I didn't know what to do with the other four. So I got really interested in trying to figure out how I could help people with anxiety in a non-medication way. Yeah. So Dr. Judd, besides using medication, what are some of the best ways to help someone with stress and anxiety? Well, I would say, and I'm biased, but this is, you know, been some of the research that my lab's done over the last decade or so. If we can learn to understand how our minds work, then we can actually put our minds to work for us instead of, you know, fighting against them. And I say that because often there's this this adage or this idea that, you know, if, if we can find what the triggers are, we can avoid the triggers uh, or the cues that, you know, cue us into worrying or, or into having a panic attack, or we can just use willpower, you know, and kind of, uh, I don't know, stop worrying. <laughs> I don't know how many of us have been told, oh, just stop worrying. <laughs> if only it was that easy. So one thing I would say that that doesn't work, it hasn't been shown to work and probably won't work, you know, go, it still won't work. It's not like we just need more time is, is this willpower approach that often, often we need, you know, or we think we need. And that we now know that, you know, the cognitive control parts of our brain, which is where willpower seems to be, you know, seated. Ironically, they're the first parts of the brain that go offline when we get stressed or anxious. So even if, you know, for, if willpower, it's really more myth than muscle, but even if it, you know, if we had a little bit of willpower, it tends to go out the window and we're really anxious. Dr. Judd, something I've heard you speak about, which I think would be very valuable for our listeners, is that if, if you could explain the difference between stress and anxiety, because I feel mm -hmm. like many people believe them to be the same thing, but you have a different take on that. Well, they certainly have shared elements. So, you know, that restless, urgy quality, you know, that's that... um you know, th that feeling of restlessness, I think they both share. I think the big difference between the two of them is that stress tends to be precipitated by something. You know, I have a deadline, so I'm stressed about this deadline. I have, you know, a, a social engagement coming up and I'm stressed about how that's going to go. And once the event passes, then, you know, we that the stress no longer has support, so it tends to go away. So you can think of, you know, stress being something we're stressed about X, Y, or Z. So it has a clear, you know, kind of pathway. Once we get past that, whatever the event is, then it tends to go away. Anxiety is very, very different. It's not that we'd never have stress again. Let me just be clear. You know, we can get stressed about something else and we can get in the habit of being, you know, a stressed out person. We start to get stressed about everything. But that's where it starts to bleed into the territory of anxiety. And so anxiety often has no clear precipitant where, you know, we just just start to feel anxious without a clear trigger or without a clear cue. For example, my patients with generalized anxiety disorder, they'll often report waking up in the morning and just feeling anxious as soon as they start to wake up. And so that is you know, that's probably the biggest difference between the two uh, because there are a lot of shared qualities as well. Does that make sense? No, yeah, it does make sense. And so I guess that kind, of, kind of leads me to my next question. Um, when you're dealing with people that are either anxious or stressed, do you think most of it stems from them dwelling on the past or they're nervous for the future? Well, stress and anxiety and kind of embedded in the definition of anxiety is kind of worry about the future, you know, so often things that have happened in the past or didn't happen in the past can trigger worry about the future, but anxiety tends to be a future oriented, you know, it's kind of like fear of the future, if you want to think of it that way. 
uh, it, like when when people do reach out to you with, I guess either stress or anxiety. What aside from meditation, do you like recommend anything that kind of could take them out of this uncomfortable state? Well, the so it start. I I think of it as a three step process. So the first step is that we have to recognize, you know, what the behavior is. And so, for example, the feeling of anxiety tends to trigger the mental behavior of worrying. So somebody starts to worry, oh no, why am I anxious? Oh no, how long is this going to last? You know, that that future oriented bit. And so just being able to recognize, oh, this is, here's my anxiety related behavior, whether it's worrying, procrastinating, uh, you know, going on social media, stress eating, drinking alcohol, all these things tend to be these coping behaviors that we've developed to try to help us cope with the, the feeling of anxiety. So being able to recognize that and even that it, it's a habit loop, you know, because we tend to, you know, when we feel anxious, we do X and then the X distracts us or makes us feel better, which then feeds back and says, next time you feel anxious, you should do this again. So that's the first step is just recognizing that habit loop. The second step is really tapping into the neuroscience of how our brains work. And that involves this part of the brain called the orbital frontal cortex, which determines and stores reward value for uh, for behaviors. And it was it's actually, the process makes a lot of sense in general life. It helps us make decisions quickly. So for example, you know, if we, it, um, you know, if we had to choose, figure out what foods we liked every day, we'd have to go and taste you know, a gazillion different foods to say, uh -huh. oh yeah, I like that food. Whereas if we lay down what's called a reward hierarchy, where it says, you know, I like this food the most, I like this food less and less and less, then when given a choice, we'll we'll make those decisions pretty quickly and it saves a lot of uh, brain space and a lot of energy. Well, the same is true for any habit. We develop a habit in, in a process that's, you know, I, I just loosely call set and forget, where we set the reward value and we forget about the details. And so worrying, for example, or procrastinating or going on social media, those behaviors, we set the reward value and we think, oh, okay, this is as good as it gets. If we really pay attention to the behavior now, so it might have helped us, something might have helped us in the past or even for a short period of time. But if it's if we pay attention to it now and ask the simple question, what am I getting from this? So for example, when somebody worries, they just assume, oh, well, there must be something helpful because I'm doing it. Um, but when people really pay attention to worrying, they realize that worrying just feeds back and makes them more anxious. It doesn't feel good in itself. And so people can start to become disenchanted with these behaviors that aren't actually serving them. Uh, for example, my lab published a study. We have this app called Eat Right Now, where it helps people with um, stress eating, overeating, things like that. And we found that when we had people pay attention as they overate, it only took 10 to 15 times of them paying attention to what it was like when they overate, what the result of that was, for that reward value to drop below zero. And once that drops below zero, they become disenchanted and less excited to do it again in the future. We've done similar studies uh, that we've published showing, you know, helping people quit smoking. People pay attention when they quit. When they're smoking, they realize that cigarettes don't actually taste very good. And so they become disenchanted. Well, we can do the same thing with worrying. So that's a really prime driver in helping people step out of these worry habit loops is to see that worrying isn't actually serving them like they assumed that it was. I'm going to pause there for a second because that can be a tricky uh, concept for some people. But does that make sense as, as I describe it? No, that does make sense. So Dr. Judd, with that being said, uh, when it comes to these coping methods, such as overeating, alcohol, cigarettes, like what, what is like, I guess what's being released in the brain that like tells you that you want food, you want alcohol, you want to smoke a cigarette, like what's happening um, at a cognitive level? Well, there are probably lots of different processes happening at the same time, but one of the key drivers in that process is a molecule that many people have heard of called dopamine, where, yes. and dopamine is this motivation molecule. Often, it is hyped it falsely, unfortunately, in the popular press as a pleasure molecule. It is anything but pleasurable. It's not supposed to be pleasurable. Uh, dopamine is a drive molecule that says, go do this. And 
it, dopamine is interesting because when we when we first learn something, so when something surprising or unexpected happens, we get a big surge of dopamine in our brain that says, oh, remember this, because this is different than what you expected. And then uh, once we learn to expect something, that dopamine firing shifts from that surprise to anticipating that event. So if we learn that uh, you know where a source of food is, then when we're hungry, our brain starts firing dopamine saying, go get, go back to that food source, go get some food. So it's, I feel like the, the last year or two, like the, the term dopamine has been become very like popular. I mean, prior to, I guess, people like Andrew Huberman talking about things like dopamine, mm -hmm. um, I did I had no idea what, what it was, like how, how it kind of affects your brain, depending on what you're doing. Why do you think that's become such, like, if you will, a mainstream word in the science world the last year or two? I mean, obviously, it's a new to it. I, let me rephrase that, because obviously, you've been familiar with it for a long time. But someone like me, who's not um, a novice in the medical field, how come I, I'm pretty familiar with that now, you think? I would say it's because it's so ubiquitous in behavior and so important. It's a, it's a very important molecule. So it's there to help us really set up uh, what, what are called context dependent memories, where we learn we learn behaviors. It's basically a, a helping us learn to set habits, for example. It's involved in any type of uh, addiction. Have you know behavioral from behaviorals to chemical addictions have been shown to fire off the dopamine system, and so a lot of you know a lot of there's a lot of emphasis on dopamine because of you know everything from forming a habit to getting addicted to something. So it affects all of us. You know, it's like so what. I, I saw something recently that your dopamine level spikes, say you're you're hitting a tough workout, right? It, it like they elevate to a point where like your body thinks it's gonna like like I don't want to say die, but it's thinking that something bad is gonna happen. And then when you the time by the time you're done with that workout, that difficult workout, like your levels get back to normal. And I kind of think that goes to something that is said that the the more you do hard things, such as like a hard workout or sauna or ice bath. It makes everything else easier. Um, I'm sure you've heard similar stuff in that regard. Why, why is it, do you think that doing difficult things, such as, like I said, like ice baths, hard physical workouts, saunas, why does that, it seems like doing difficult things like that makes everything else a little bit easier. Uh, why? What's going on in the brain to kind of like, when you put yourself through hard things, things don't seem as bad on the other end. That's a good question. That is probably more a question for Andrew Huberman in terms of workouts uh, than than myself. I'm, you know, my expertise is more in in habit formation and breaking bad habits. So, you know, the one thing I would say here is that our our brains are wired for not liking things that are unexpected, as well as um, you know, our brains don't like change, basically. And so if something is new uh, or different, our brain is wired to say, hey, is this dangerous? You know, is this dangerous or is this just different? And when something becomes less different or more familiar, then our brain say, okay, it's okay. You know, this isn't, this isn't dangerous. And so, you know, most things that become familiar feel less uh, challenging just because of the fact that we're overcoming that, uh, that, you know, state of, you know, oh no, is this dangerous type of thing? Uh, there are probably other things going on during workouts, but I'm not, <laughs> I, I don't really know. And that, that kind of leads me. So obviously aside from meditation, what do you, what do you do uh, physically to keep yourself in shape, keep yourself sharp, both mentally and physically? Well, I would say I, I'm very keen on, you know, exercise. So I'm a big fan of having some type of aerobic as well as, you know, weight, weight training, uh, routine that helps, you know, helps keep the body and the mind, uh, sharp. There are lots of research studies showing that physical exercise is good for the, not just for the body, but also for the brain. Uh, yeah, Dr. Judd. So just like what, with the, with the relationship between physical fitness and the brain, um, 
Can you kind of get delve deeper into that? Well, there, there are a fair number of studies showing the physical exercise is helpful for releasing things like uh, these molecules called uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF, and other molecules that are important for, you know, brain function, uh, for learning, for, you know, basically for, for well-being. So there's, there's quite a bit out there suggesting, you know, this, this body brain connection is certainly more connection than, than separate. And so, you know, I think this is where the, the adage of, of physical exercise is really, you know, helping our brains really important. The other thing I would say is that mental exercise is, I would say is just as important as physical exercise. So here learning how our brains work, learning how to work with our brains. So for, for me, it started with meditation. I would say one of the healthiest things we can do for our brains is to train our brains to be curious so that we don't get locked into, you know, fixed mindsets or old, you know, old habits where we become rigid and it makes it harder for us to learn. You know, I think of it this way as, you know, often, well, our brains are set up to have this comfort zone, you know, where we're comfortable, we know things are safe, but if we stay in that comfort zone too long, it's hard to venture out into and to explore new things. And so curiosity helps us move into our growth zone and at the same time, develop that growth zone as a comfort zone. So we can be comfortable and even interested, you know, that's what curiosity is all about in learning new things rather than just keeping things status quo. And when you are dealing with people that suffer from um, things like addiction, that on top of that experience anxiety and stress, did something, did something usually happen previously at an earlier point in their life, which has built that up to where they are now? Or is it really different in every kid situation dependent on the person? It's really individual. You know, it's hard to give some generic formulaic, you know, this is, this is what happens for everybody. And this is actually one of the things that that's really wonderful about humans is that we are all so individual. And so I love being a psychiatrist because no two patients are the same. No two people are the same. Yeah. Dr. Joe, you mentioned meditation. To me, it seems like there's a lot of forms of meditation. One, what kind of meditation do you do personally? And would you define meditation as just focusing on one thing at that given moment, being in the present? Or how would you define meditation? Yeah, I think there are many different types of meditation. And honestly, the the form, the most important thing about the, the type of meditation is for someone to find what type of meditation works for them in that in that moment or in, for a certain time frame. So I've I've practiced a number of different types of meditations over the years based on you know, where I was in my practice, what I needed and what my evolution was. So there are two, I would say, general categories of meditation. One is where there's a focus on an object, you know, so, you know, the popular types of meditation, you know, where there's a mantra, where somebody focuses on a mantra as a way to, to concentrate, uh, develop concentration, or also focus on a physical sensation, like physical sensations of breathing. So those are ways to help uh, focus and still the mind. And then there are, there's another category that's in some traditions is described as insight meditation, where one is paying attention, you know, just being curious about what's happening in any one moment and not getting caught up in a story about that moment or a, a interpretation of what's happening. They're just really being present with what's happening and that helps us uh, see, you know, kind of the nature of reality. Often we assume that things aren't really changing or changing very, uh, you know, very so slowly that we don't perceive it. And then we, we forget that there is change, but that's, that's often a cause of, of suffering, <laughs> we, you know, whether, whether we're aging or we get sick or, you know, we lose a loved one or something like that. All of those can be sources of suffering if we're not aware of kind of this, this nature of reality, which is everything's always changing. And so some of these insight meditation practices are helpful for helping us really be in tune with constant change and not be attached to, you basically not be attached to anything, not be attached to concepts, not be attached to our health, not be attached 
to uh, you know to things not changing basically. And when we when we learn to let go and kind of be with change, uh, it certainly eases the suffering quite a bit. So we don't we don't we don't add to the sources of suffering. Absolutely. Uh, that's yeah. That's um, very interesting. But Dr. Judd, something I want to sh- uh, shift gears here with. I believe I heard you talk about it on the Whoop podcast, but that is a uh, flow state. I know you've talked about it in the past. What like obviously there's times where you maybe doubt yourself and don't feel like you're able to achieve a, a given task. What is like what is happening at, at, at a cognitive level when you are in flow state? So just building on, we can build on this discussion of of what meditation is. So if if we think of you know, one way to look at different categories of meditation, my lab's done a number of different studies where we've looked at the brains of expert meditators. And we have this working hypothesis that there's, you know, when somebody is anxious, for example, or they're caught up in a craving, or they're worried about something, there tends to be this closed down contracted quality of experience. And this seems to activate a network of brain regions called the default mode network, which is a self-referential brain network where, you know, we're worrying about ourselves in the future, worrying about our future, it's basically a, a self, you know, like me, me, me network is the way I think of it. And so with, with meditation practices, or even simply being curious moment to moment when we're, you know, not necessarily doing some formal meditation practice, we're moving away from that closed down contracted experience into a more open and expanded uh, experience. And this starts to coincide or correlate with what the psychologist Mihai Csikszentmihalyi described as flow state. So he described flow as being effortless, selfless, timeless, and very, you know, it's like that, that expansion is so big that we lose a sense of where we end and where the rest of the world begins. So we become merged with, with our surroundings, with our world, and we lose a sense of self. So you can think of meditation as a way to point out you know where we're caught up in a sense of self whether it's caught up in a thought caught up in an idea about ourselves you know caught up in this or that and also uh being able to help us kind of let go and be with our experience and as we learn to be with our experience more and more and more we are literally flowing through life and we can learn to kind of move more and more in the direction of flow as we learn to uh, to find conditions that s- support expansion. So, for example, uh, curiosity, kindness, connection, all of these support uh, more of a, an expanded, opened uh, mind state as compared to anxiety or frustration or anger, because those tend to be about you know, me, I'm angry, I'm frustrated, I'm, I'm anxious. So that's where, you know, you can, you can see the two ends of the spectrum when we're so caught up in ourselves, we're just caught up in, you know, contracted down into this tiny ball of me, me, me. And then when we learn to expand, we lose a sense of self altogether. And that's, you know, that's consistent with the flow state. Interesting. It it is someone that is so experienced in meditation and so mindful of of uh, your thoughts how how often at this point in your life and career do you catch yourself like unpresent and you got to kind of like gravitate back to where you were and just like realize that you need to focus on on the now well it's certainly easier to to get focused on the now and remain focused because it just it feels so much better than being lost although it's it's still a constant practice you know it's it's easy for the mind to get in a, a habitual thought pattern for example and i would say it's certainly easier now to notice those thought patterns and how unrewarding they are and that makes it easier to let go of them and to you know drop back into a, a habit of being curious yeah and how do how does one break a uh, habitual thought pattern well, here it goes back to this idea of, you know, reward-based learning. And so, you know, our brains are going to learn to do things that are rewarding, and they're also going to learn to stop doing things that aren't rewarding. And so if we see how unrewarding it is 
to be caught up in and you know in a habitual pattern of frustration or anger you know often these things relate to not getting what we want or things aren't going our way so if we notice you know if something isn't going my way and i get frustrated and that frustration doesn't actually make things go more my way it just makes things worse then i can become disenchanted with the frustration so that's where i can start to let go of that old habit Mm-hmm. And then that opens the space for something new and different, like just being curious, like, oh, you know, instead of going, oh, no, why is this happening to me? I can't, you know, getting frustrated and go, oh, well, this didn't go as, as planned. <laughs> what what other possibilities are out there? And it opens us to look around and see what might be possible as compared to kind of doubling down on a strategy that's not working for us. You know, I love this saying you know, the definition of insanity, you know, it's a joke, you know, what's the definition of insanity doing, uh, you know, basically doing something again, that didn't work (laughs) and expecting it to be different this time. (laughs) So, you know, I think that's a great reminder of getting stuck in some of our old ruts and thinking, oh, well, you know, I'm I'm just going to double down. Well, that sounds pretty insane to me as compared to kind of opening and saying, okay, that didn't work. What, what else might I try? Yeah, that's that's a good way to look. That's good. I like that uh, thought process there. Um, something that I want to talk to you about. I know you're author of numerous books. What goes into writing a book? I mean, how much preparation is there? How many years of of knowledge accumulation and just overall? How what goes into that? Well, for me, I would say, you know, it's I've only I've uh, I've only written two books, but I would say it was probably about. 20 years of experience (laughs) before, before sitting down to write a book. And so for example, my, my first book, uh, the craving mind was about, you know, the, the process of, you know, of habit formation, like how habits form and looking at my own experience, looking at the neuroscience research that my lab had, had done and looking at some of the other research and kind of bringing all of that together and that really was based on a lot of, you know, a lot of research uh, that my lab had done, that other labs had done, uh, but also my own direct experience with, you know, getting stuck in a lot of different types of, you know, even being addicted to distraction or being addicted to my own thoughts, et cetera. And, but also that, you know, that accumulation of knowledge, you know, really took a long time for, before I felt like I was ready to write a book. And then, you know, the book came out, you know, I could, I could write the book, you know, relatively quickly because all that, all that knowledge and research was there. And then with my second book, the uh, Unwinding Anxiety book, it was more of a pragmatic book around, you know, habit formation and how habits form, especially with anxiety, because I didn't even know that when I was in residency or medical school. And then years and years of experience working with patients and trying out some of these new methods for helping people unwind their anxiety uh, that, you know, that were, that were very different than what I'd been taught and and what I, you know, what I'd learned in medical school and residency. And, uh, yeah. Something that, that I feel like a lot of these questions that we ask a lot of the, a lot, every, a lot of stuff keeps going back to meditation and mindfulness. So that leads me to my next question, a personal question. Um, like, when I'm in the sauna, right, you talk about avoid thinking, but say I'm in the sauna and I'm focused on keeping my heart rate as low as possible. How do I, sub, I guess, subconsciously avoid thinking about that and just do it? <laughs> That's a great question. So this, I, I don't really know the answer, <laughs> but here I would say often, you know, there's this paradox in life when we try to force something, it tends not to go well. And so I would say in general, it's helpful to, you know, learn the processes. So for example, what are, what are processes that can, can consistently and reliably reduce our heart rate, for example, and learn those, and then also see what gets in the way of that. So if we worry, oh no, I need to get my heart rate down, that worrying tends to increase our heart rate, you know, using that as an example. So I would say, it you know as with much of life it's really about understanding the processes behind a certain question whether it's learning our heart rate or changing our relationship with our thoughts etc 
and then you know finding what what is reliably helpful you know not just you know oh i you know i i did some little ritual and that did it this time but then you know it didn't didn't work in the future well of course it's a ritual it's not going to not going to be consistent yeah and, and we dr judd we know you're pressed on time so i i this is a question i've been curious about for years um I haven't really done much research into it, but I, I know what it is. Can you kind of explain to us and our listeners, like what is the placebo effect and what is happening in our brains when we tell ourselves we need something um, in that regard? That's a really good question. And that is also beyond my expertise. So there's a, a researcher, Ted, I think his last name is pronounced Kap Kapchuk at Harvard, who has spent his career studying the placebo effect. And, you know, there, the long story short is there's a whole lot going on in our brain when we expect something to work. And my take home from this research is that our brains are a lot more powerful than we give them credit for. So this power of expectation is extremely powerful itself. And there's a whole lot of neuroscience that kind of goes into explaining um, how it might work or what some of the neural processes are. Yet, I don't think anybody's completely nailed um, why that's the case uh, or, or, you know, or, or how powerful it is. I think there are a lot of demonstrations that, you know, placebo is extremely powerful, ranging from, you know, across a whole host of situations. Uh, but again, I'm, I'm not the, I'm not the expert on that. Okay. But no, I was de definitely, definitely give a better understanding uh, what I, than what I currently had. So Thank you for that explanation. And um, before we let you go, Dr. Judd, I'd like to ask you a few rapid fire questions, if that's all right with you. Sure. Um, so is is it fair to compare meditation, like lifting weights for the brain? Yes. Okay, that's good to know. Um, a lot of people look up to you and um, are encouraged by what you've done and your in your your books and your talks. Who is your role model and or inspiration? Well, I, there have been a number of historical figures that I think are real uh, examples of, of, you know, kindness, curiosity, and compassion, you know, so historically speaking, you know, the Buddha um, really yeah. came up with this very simple system of how to understand our mind. Uh, he's been described as a super scientist um, by some. So I would say historically, uh, he is, and then, you know, there, there are just so many examples of people who are acting selflessly and compassionately, both historically and in modern day, uh, you know, th those are the folks that I look up to. And, I, you know, it doesn't even have to be some famous, famous person, just seeing somebody on the street being kind to somebody else. In that moment, I look up to them because they are demonstrating uh, what I'd like to see more of in the world. I love that answer. Um, what is something you hope to accomplish by the end of this year? Well, I hope uh, we're, we're creating uh, some new digital therapeutics. Uh, to So I hope that we will actually be able to launch a, a depression program by the end of the year to help round out our mental health suite. So we've got this really robust anxiety program where we've done randomized control trials showing that we can get a 67% reduction in anxiety. We've, um, and we hope to, you know, round up the other side of that equation so that we can, we can help people with depression as well. That's amazing. amazing. And this last question is one that I've been very curious to hear your answer to in your lifetime. How many books do you think you've read? Wow. Great question. <laughs> I have no idea. I love reading books. I have bookshelves. You know, my wife and I, our house is basically filled with bookshelves. Is <laughs> even <laughs> so? I would say a lot of books, and I hope to never stop learning. <laughs> would you That's say awesome. over? Would you say over a thousand? That's it's possible, and I have no idea. But yeah, <laughs> very possible. All right. Well, Dr. Judd. Um, Really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Um, like I was telling Evan, you're one of the few people that out there that kind of makes science cool and understandable. So I, I know that anyone's heard you speak or uh, read your books feels the same way. And 
It's been an honor having you on the Everything But Politics podcast. Well, thanks again for having me. And I also want to give a quick shout out to Cappy Arnold for putting this together and uh, being a great pleasure to work with throughout the last month. So really happy we got to do this. And uh, thank you very much for your time. See you guys next week.